Welcome, welcome to Humanized Online Learning. Thank you for joining me and Michelle today. Thank you for being here. So today we're gonna to talk to you about a framework for facilitation and course design, humanizing our online learning experiences for our students. Before we get into everything, we do wanna let you know that all of the resources we're sharing with you today are online at our goodie bag. And you'll see that link in the first few slides we're gonna share with you today. So no need to furiously write down notes and all that good stuff. Everything's available online and hopefully you're hearing me okay. I'll hold this a little closer. So I'm Katie Palacios. I'm an instructional design coordinator for the San Diego Community College District. Um, also working with At One and doing some instructional design work for OEI. I'm also an online um, instructor up at Miracosta. And hi everyone, I'm Michelle Pekansky brock I'm currently at CSU Channel Islands as a teaching and learning innovation specialist. Um, I have a long history in the California Community College system as well as a full-time faculty, part-time faculty, and I did a lot of work with At One over the years. So. Um, I probably have met a lot of you online but not in person, so come say hi afterwards if that's one of, one of if you fall into that group. And as Katie mentioned a minute ago, um, we have a goodie bag that we put together. It's got all of our, our goodies that we're going to share inside of it, and you're welcome to take it with you. It's not going to go anywhere, so don't panic. A lot of times people come up afterwards and say, is that going to go away tomorrow, and it's not. Um, but we would like to encourage you to go to this site if you haven't yet. If you do have a device, it should render fine on a mobile um, or laptop, whatever you have with you, because we have a little activity for you on this site that we'd like to engage you in. So the URL is tiny.cc slash humanizing OTC, and that last part does have to be all lowercase, tiny.cc slash humanizing OTC. And um, when you get there, this is what you're gonna see. Our presentation's embedded at the top, but it's this little er um, area down in the lower right corner. Can you raise your hand if you're on the site so I can see how, just a few people. Okay. <laughs> it's loading, that's what I was afraid of, okay. <laughs> so when you do get to the site, if you could go down to that little box in the lower right corner, I'm gonna leave this up instead of going to the site so you still have the URL. There's a box in the lower right corner that says, um, that has a question for you. And what, let me ask you this first of all. How many of you have been a student in an online class? Ooh, nice. Good. Okay. So I think the large majority, almost everybody just raised their hand. I want you to think about your experiences as a student for a minute. So put away the teaching and go back to yourself as a student in an online class. And I want you, in one word, to describe those, that experience. In one word, type that into that box that you see on that page. This is where the, what the box looks like. We've Keep trying because yeah, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Stuff's it's coming working. in. Answers are coming in. So if it's not working, just reload and try. <laughs> in one word, describe your experience as an online student. Okay, we're gonna give you about 10 more seconds and then we're gonna take a look at your responses. Mm. Okay, so let's take a look and see um, what people said here. So this word cloud represents your answers. The words that are bigger were words that uh, were shared more than one time. So the most popular response here is the word lonely. I didn't plant that. 
you said that. I've done this with many, 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 many groups over the past year or so, and this is the consistent theme. I have confidence, sadly, that this is what comes out. And this is why we're doing this today, okay? Because we want to change this around. Um, and as, as great online teachers that you are, you are interested in creating an experience for your students that is not lonely, right? Thank you. <laughs> so let's go back over here. I'm gonna play a video in just one second. And it's a 30 second video. And this is a clip of a student, an online student. And we wanna hear what he has to say about his online learning experiences. I can see that a professor isn't trying to interact with the course. And I, it's just little things like, the automatic announcements that only show up at 12 a.m. on a Sunday. Like, you know it's all uh, automated. They're just not, or you leave a question and ask the <coughs> professor, and three weeks later you get a response. Like, that's when I start to judge. Like, I just wish you wouldn't be here. Like, I wish you would focus your energy somewhere else because I'm not learning anything. But, yeah, so that's the only judgment is when you're not doing anything. We don't care when you make mistakes, though. How does that make you feel? Not so good, huh? Not such a good feeling. Um, and the point here isn't that automated announcements aren't bad, but the point is, if that's all you're doing, <laughs> then that's not a good thing, and it's not gonna relate who you are, right, and make you present in your own class. So I think a big part of this idea of humanizing is it's a little bit of a mind shift, because I know as teachers, instructional designers, whatever our roles are, um, we're often very much focused on our discipline, on our content, on our subject matter, on assessment, and you know, putting all that stuff together. But it's really important to take a few steps back and view what you're developing as an experience, a human experience, okay? okay. The last line he said in that video was, we don't care if you make mistakes. That was what he said to his teacher. So you'll find the entire, the infographic in our goodie bag here, but this is the twofold approach to humanizing the online learning experience, right? So you've got the course design piece of it, designing those humanized, designing those assessments, designing the, the activities that are gonna relate to your student in the context that they're at, right? Collaborating, getting them to construct meeting. These six C's, they're in, um, that infographic that we've posted in the um, goodie bag. But then the facilitation piece of this, presence, empathy, and awareness, the part that is really, it's, that's the, the, the part that happens right there in the moment, right? The interaction with the student. And I think it's often, it's, it's um, common to focus on the course design part and maybe to set it and forget it, uh, the crock pot methodology of online teaching, where you know you just kind of let it run and at 12 a.m. the students are getting those announcements, right, without you really being present. And it's obvious to the students as well. So we wanna share with you today um, some of our practices for presence, empathy, and awareness. We're focusing today on that facilitation piece, presence, empathy, and awareness. So let's first look at what we mean by presence, empathy, and awareness. Presence is, this is imperfect is perfect. That's why I love the last line of that video because we talk about our presence in the online classroom. We think about, okay, yeah, I posted a welcome video and I'm doing a feed, giving my students feedback. But I think a lot of times we worry about that being perfect and we worry about how that comes across to our online students. But our imperfections is what's gonna make us human to them. And that's a great connection that we can make with our students to I use wanna, that. I wanna add one thing yeah. to a little story. Um, this actually came out of one of the at one classes that I was teaching years ago. I used to teach building online community for social media and we um, all, 
connected in voice threads in that class back then. And so I could hear faculty tell their stories. And I remember one faculty member um, sharing a story about she was teaching online and she had sent feedback to a student through email. And that student wrote back to her and said, oh my gosh, I always thought my online instructors were computers. <laughs> and that has always stuck with me. I mean, and I share it with every group that I have, in, every group of faculty, instructional designers I have in front of me because that's so important. You know, sometimes we think, oh, I'm always in there. I'm always doing stuff. I'm, well, they don't know that. That's not you as a person. That's not your presence. So empathy, sense and understand emotions and communicate that understanding, right? So we're talking about being approachable for students. How, how do we communicate online that we're approachable, right? How do you do that in the online environment? Um, how do you um, let them know where to go for help? How do you show them that you're available for support? All that, those things have to be intentional online. Otherwise, they're not going to see it. They're not going to feel it. Can I add something there, too? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, the work of Brene Brown has been really big for me in this, this topic of empathy. Some of you might know her work. And she refers a lot to the work of Teresa Wiseman, who is a nursing, who's a nurse who's done research into empathy. And she's got a couple of um, empathy is the ability to see the world as others see it, to be non judgmental to understand another person's feelings and to let them know that you understand those feelings. And she also says that empathy is a skill and it takes practice to reach out for empathy and it also takes practice to give empathy. And I think about that a lot. So um, when you're thinking about your online classes, you know, I, that's t this to me is the hardest thing. So we're going to talk a little bit about that later when we get into some practices about how we can integrate this concept. Be mindful about bringing empathy into our classes. And then awareness, understanding your students' needs, right? So um, finding out who they are. It's that survey that you're posting in the early in the semester. It's that icebreaker forum. Actually reading those and finding out where they're at, what's going on in their lives right now, what's going to be competing for attention with your students, a lot of things. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the kind of stuff that has to be designed into the course to, to be able to elicit that information from them early on to know what their needs are going to be from you. Yes? No? <laughs> she told me I could jump in. You can. Please do. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more concretely now about how these things play out in our online learning experiences, in our classes, or in classes that we've seen. So presence, empathy, and awareness. That's where we're coming at these from. And for me, you know, I'm a big fan of video. And my very first example is not video. My actual, my very first example I'm going to share with you is just text. Um, I'll read the big green box on the right. This is um, on my contact me page in my class. This is the required I will, I will get back to you within 24 hours message, right? Here's how I phrase it to the students. If you contact me and you don't hear back from me right away, I've probably got my hands full of groceries, kids, Play-Doh, or all of the above. I'm sure some of you know that feeling. If 24 hours pass and you haven't heard from me, then feel free to nudge me with another message. So. I'm sharing a lot there. I'm sharing a little bit about myself, my personal life. I'm saying, hey, I'm not perfect. I hope to get back to you in 24 hours, but that might not happen because I got a lot going on too, just like some of you. So I'm relating you know, my parenthood craziness with a lot of my students that are going through the same stuff. So I do that intentionally. I thought about really how, I, how to say that, how to share those things in a way that my students can connect to it, they see the human side of me, but also that I really am there for them and I really, I do wanna, um, I want them to come with me with any issues they might have. Um, other, over here, my, um, this other green box, this is, um, I don't know why, this is like the key phrase that works um, for me. When my, you know, it's, let's say my deadlines are usually Sunday nights, so Monday I notice that a student hasn't submitted their weekly work from the previous work. 
in the subject line, that student's going to get an email with their name in the subject, Johnny, you know, I don't remember what I said, Johnny, whatever. In the, the message itself, I'll say, hey, Johnny, I realized, I noticed I didn't get your submission last week. Is everything okay? Signed, Katie. For whatever reason, that really seems to get a response. Is everything okay? It's totally open. They can come back with a response on, you know, maybe something's going on in their family life. But lots of times they'll be like, oh, yeah, everything's fine. I was just late. I just didn't get it in. You know, I mean, like, they, there's a sense of concern and um, that empathy, that awareness that that seems to really achieve with my students. And then I use this in areas of the course that, are conf that I know are going to be confusing to them. You know what those areas are. I say, this can, this can be confusing. Reach out for support if you need it. I, I intentionally, I explicitly write that out, and I'm not, not going to assume that they know the parts that are confusing, because maybe everything's confusing, right? But I'm going to say, this can be confusing, so reach out for support if you need it. Okay, so those were my language examples. Now we'll move into some um, picture examples. So the very first assignment that I have the students to do is to send me a file so they get practice submitting a file to me in the system, but the file that they're sending to me is a selfie. And what we're doing as part of this activity is we're creating our class picture. So I actually have them, so I, I post the template so that they know kind of what I'm going for here. I got the selfie template and then they're going to be, they submit to me, you know, through the assignment tool, they're each submitting to me a JPEG that I'm compiling into our class picture. And then I put myself at the bottom, thank you for sharing your selfie, here's to a great semester together. So we're, you know, this is a fully online class, we're never together, but at least here visually, we're together, we're on the same page, we're all in this learning experience together. So we're aware, we're present, and, um, they had a lot of fun with this. You can see only one of my students didn't send me a selfie. And then he stays with the little template head. <laughs> Actually, on this page, at the top of the page, I said, I said to the student, I said, Lorenzo, we need your picture. When you send it to me, I'll update it. But I never got it from him. OK, so pictures give a personal touch. Here's where, and there's tons of resources out there, of course, to get other people's pictures and to find great pictures to use in your course. But we've also, in our um, pockets. We've got cameras that we can use to take pictures of what's going on around us that really gives a personal touch to our course. So this is a kind of a collage of different pictures that I use in different places of my course, but I was on campus when I was teaching for Southwestern and there was this cool on the um, uh, whatever that thing's called, Jumbotron? I don't know what that's called. That <laughs> on that board. Welcome students, we're glad you're here. We are Jaguars. And I was like, I was driving by, actually this is a picture out of my car window like this. But I was like, I, would, I want that to be for my online students. We're Jaguars, we're here too. Like we might be online, but we're still part of this community, right? So I grabbed that picture and I used it when I was teaching at Southwestern. I like having a picture of me holding the textbook. It's not just the textbook. I'm connected to it. My face is next to it. I'm holding it. It's like part of that triangle of the teacher, discipline, student that we heard about in the keynote today. It's like I'm connected to it too. Um, so I use that anytime I assign something in the book, I use that picture and they're like, all right, she owns the text. She knows what we're going through here. I have um, this little signature picture that I use in different places throughout my course. So, you know, on, on an app, you can sign your name, take a screenshot of it, do some editing, and reuse this. I put that at the bottom of the syllabus. I'll put that at the bottom of my announcements. It's just like a nice touch that's me um, that's a little bit more than text. And it's pretty simple to do once you've got that image. And then my frustration image. <laughs> so this is me pulling my hair out. And I'll say, don't pull your hair out. Go here for support, try that for support. So it's me in my class. They see my face a lot in my class in the images. And these are all images that I've taken and you know not taken. But there's a lot that we can do for our students um, with, that, with the camera, just with photos. Um, and I think they wanna see that. It does, it gives that personal touch. We're human, 
and it helps them to see that. This is you. Okay, so for a minute I want to talk about the syllabus. Something that I would take the leap to say that everybody has for their class these days. And if you're teaching online, you know, we often say that syllabus is so, so important. It's got all the stuff that my students need to know. And I totally agree with that, right? I mean, there's a lot of critical information in there. But I want you to know that that syllabus is more than that. That syllabus is your often first opportunity to grab your students' attention and leave your mark on them. So what I started doing was um, using something other than a PDF for my syllabus. I started designing my syllabus um, as a digital syllabus. And this was made with a tool called popular.me, and that, there, that link is on your, your resource site. Um, and I think I actually have a link to the syllabus if you want to check it out also. And so you'll see that it, it's, got, it's got lots of visuals. It's got a, a picture from, our, from the book cover. Um, but that's not what I wanted to show you. Um, it also is an opportunity for me to share a quick video, a course bumper video that I created using a tool called Animoto. I'm Michelle Bikansky Brock, and I'll be your instructor for the history of still photography. This is a tintype from about 1860. Why is it that even though these images were not fragile, people still carried them around in cases? So I'm not going to play the whole thing. Um, but, you know, it's a way to, I pull in, you know, course outcomes, but also me talking to my students and asking some fun questions and infusing a little bit of personality. And having that on the syllabus really is a game changer, right? Um, it's an opportunity for them to get to know a little bit about me. And then I also have another video here that I just recorded. It's just a hello to my students. I recorded it right in front of my webcam and put it in there. Um, so that's something to think about. How do things change when you create what I like to call a liquid syllabus? It's kind of a fun way to think about it. And this also renders beautifully on a mobile and it's, a it's just a public website so students can bookmark it right on their phones. All right. Um, going back to this concept of awareness, something that I always do week one in my online class is um, what Katie referenced earlier, a quick survey. I use Google Forms, and they're, they're, these are not all the questions that I ask, but I think that these are the most powerful and important questions for me to, to ask students because I get such rich data about what's going on on my students' end. It helps me be aware of what's happening on the other side of that you know, online environment that I can't see and I'm not aware of unless I dig in and try to excavate that. So I say in one word, describe how you're feeling about this class. So I get largely most of the people, students will say fine, excited, interested, but every, there's usually a few students in every class that say nervous, anxious, overwhelmed. Those are the students, those are the students that are in the red zone. They're the ones that are freaking out about whatever it might be and need you. And if we don't do this, we can't become aware of who they are. And what I love about Google Forms is that it populates all of this into a spreadsheet that I can just keep available throughout the semester. So if we're getting one of those students that isn't logging in, I can go to that spreadsheet and I can look at the person's response to, is there anything else I should be aware of that may affect your success? Or is there anything else you would like to share with me now? I have students from those questions tell me, I'm pregnant and I'm delivering my baby in four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I just returned from Afghanistan and I have severe PTSD. I have epilepsy. I'm caring for my mother who is on life support. I mean, all of that becomes apparent to you. And when you have that information, all of a sudden, those students who aren't logging in as much as you expect them to, you start to understand it in a human context, and that's really important. Back to you. 
So I do use a lot of videos with my um, students as well. And I have my students do a video assignment. So information systems, people being the most important part of an information system. My students do a video explaining the information systems that they use and um, kind of just share their role in information systems in their life. So. I have here, this is a student doing one of those, but it's, I'm gonna, I'll, you'll see, I kick that off. So it's me kind of with him. Hi students, okay, so for this assignment, one of your options is to submit a short two minute to four minute video response. So you have the option, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about that option here, as well as show you an example from a previous student video. I want you to see an example of a student who did that in a previous class of mine. So thank you, Austin, for sharing this example. Take a look. Uh, my name is Austin, and I am doing a video submission for week two activity talking about people um, in an information system. Uh, personally, for me, I think, I think people are the main component in an information system just because uh, without, without us operating a system or creating the system, there is no system. And when you ask to, for us to look at it from a personal view and how much we use an information system in a day, uh, I just decided to think of, think of how many times I'd use an information system in, on an average day. So the first thing is phones and just setting my alarm in the morning to get up um, to get up to go to work and things like that I, I have to use an information system there has to be a system set up inside the phone just for me to click on the application to to use it as a as a um, alarm the next thing is also included in phones is uh, using Pandora while I drive um, that's a music app, a lot of people. Um, also just calling or texting people is, is another thing that everyone does in an information system. Um, it, and then at work, uh, using a cash register also is, is being involved in the information system because using a credit card, um, it, it really just, uh, it has to send it through the internet to wherever it goes, I really don't know, but um, I know it goes somewhere, and I know it has to be a system. Um, and then... <laughs> I know it goes somewhere, I know it has to be a system. <laughs> after work, me coming home, I use my computer a lot, I... I mm. More or less what we're going for. <laughs> Thank you, and I will be back for the next assignment. Okay, so that's more or less what we're going for. <laughs> more or less what we're going for. <laughs> he was such a fun student. So, um, oh, uh oh, what did I do? Mm, go back to present. There we go. So getting students to share their stories. I mean, that was our kickoff assignment for the first couple of weeks, and it really, thanks, it really, um, broke the ice right away when students are sharing that level with each other. You know, you see where he's at, he's open, he's honest about it. He was really excited about doing that video. But um, the other thing too is content kickoff videos. So this is like on a weekly basis when I'm kicking off content, I really try to bring in the context of the content for my students. Why is it that what we're learning this week, this particular content, why is it going to be important to them? How will it benefit them? Um, and I try to do that in a way that's very personal. And I shared, in this particular one, I shared a story. So this is our third week of Excel. And this week, we're going to be learning how to navigate huge spreadsheets of data. So this is the week that reminds me of that project I was on at Accenture when I was a little analyst. And I had to send the weekly status report to the head honcho, our project partner. Um, every week, I had to send them a big spreadsheet that was formatted just so. And it was um, quite the learning experience for me. It makes me nervous and anxious just thinking about it. Um, 
So this week, you will be deleting and inserting worksheets. You'll be updating formulas. You will be using find and replace. So remember, we used find and replace in Microsoft Word. You can use it in Excel, super useful, time-saving tool in Excel as well. We'll be using um, splitting windows. So you can access different parts of the same spreadsheet at the same time. Freeze panes, where you can decide how many rows or how many columns are frozen while you scroll through the rest of the data in the spreadsheet. Goal Seek is another useful tool we'll be looking at this week. So check that out this week. As you're doing so, think of little me on my first project at Accenture, biting my nails to deliver that weekly status report in Excel to the uh, head honcho of our project. You guys will be way better prepared for that task or tasks similar to it than I ever was, that's for sure. Best of luck this week. So I've personalized it. They know what they're going to be learning. They know why it's important. It's very hands-on. This is Excel. This is Excel, right? It's possible to, possible to make this personal for our students. I mean, this is Microsoft Office we're talking about. And every week there's, you know, something that I can do to connect my students with it. Why should they learn this? Where are they going to use it? So that's what I try to do in those real short content kickoff videos. Oops. Okay, um, so earlier we referenced empathy. And um, empathy is the kind of skill that we are naturally inclined to kind of associate with a synchronous environment, right? So when someone's in front of you, you know when they're reaching out for empathy. And you, you know when it's time to, to give empathy. How, how are some of the ways that you know that? body gesture, facial expression, voice intonation, right? Okay, so online, if we're not using voice, it can be challenging. That's one of the reasons I always use voice in my online classes. Um, I am going to share a clip from an icebreaker activity from my history of photography class. Um, and it's an activity where students have a choice, one of those six C's, they have a choice of photographs to pick from, and the photographs vary from um, their historical photographs. There's one of like the you know the first photograph of the Earth taken from the Moon. Um, there's a photograph of the Wright brothers' airplane lifting off the ground. The photograph of the first X-ray, and then there are some that get very emotional and intense. They pick one, so they can pick any one they want. Uh, this student that I'm about to share, she picked a very difficult image, and she shared a story that was quite intense. As soon as I saw this picture, I knew I had a comment on it. It brings back so many memories. I used to live in Pennsylvania, and on September 11th, my school went into complete lockdown until they were able to locate uh, the plane that disintegrated in the field. Um, it was a, the plane was about 10 minutes away from where uh, we were. Um, my mom was eventually able to uh, pick us up from school and take us home. And uh, me and my brother, we laid in the front yard all day because there were fighter jets flying over our house nonstop. Um, we thought it was pretty cool. Um, I was only 11, he was nine, I think. So we really didn't understand what was happening. Um, my uh, my mom wouldn't even let us watch the TV, but I was uh, sneaky and snuck into her bedroom. And the only thing that I saw was the second tower falling. Um, I thought it was a movie at first. I still wasn't aware of anything happening. Um, I went to school the next day and uh, there was a couple girls I used to hang out with, and they found out that their dads had passed away. One worked in the twin, uh, one of the twin towers, and the other one worked in the Pentagon. Um, so that was that was pretty hard. Um, um, I know some people obviously had worse experience than that day, but it was it was pretty hectic. Caitlin. I wish you were in front of me so I could reach out and give you a hug. Um, 
I just wanted to say thank you so very much for sharing that incredibly heartfelt comment with all of us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a really big believer in learning through shared experiences. And obviously, you were very close to this tragedy. And um, so I go on and on. Um, but I think you, you get the point there, how much voice, and it doesn't also have to be video. I think voice can do a lot more than text. Uh, it doesn't mean that everything has to have voice or video in it, but that variety does wonders also in terms of changing the way your, lear your students are learning. Uh, we're starting to embrace principles of universal design for learning. I could go off on a whole tangent here that I'm not going to go off on. Um, but what occurred to me when I heard that student's comment was, wow. I remember sitting there in front of my computer and thinking, wow, like if she was in front of me in the classroom, it would be my, it would be everything about my body gesture, my expression that would convey how I was feeling to her. And I probably more than anything wouldn't say much because there's something very empathetic about just silence, right? But here I had to say something because here silence is my lack of presence. So I think that's just something something to remember, something to think about. So I do, you know, I don't shy away from from encouraging students to share emotional experiences because that again going back to Brené Brown who I am such a huge fan of, she says that humans are wired for connection. We are wired to connect with each other. And so if we shut that down in our students learning experiences, we're really missing out on a lot and our students are really missing out on a lot. Um, so th this brings me to this fabulous research study that I learned about, I don't know, a year ago or so, about on something called neural coupling. Um, and I am obviously, I'm not a neuroscientist, but the study, uh, there were people placed inside of MRI machines and, and, and visual renderings of their brains were taken. And through these pictures um, in the MRI machine, they were listening to someone tell a story as their brains were being imaged. And what this study found was that as a person tells us, so they, they imaged the person's brain who told the story and they imaged the person's brain who was listening to the story. And they did this over and over. Um, and it shows that the listener has similar parts of their brain, affective or emotional parts that light up, that are activated as they listening to the person telling the story. So this concept of storytelling, you know, the stories that, that Katie gave examples of sharing in her class, if you can get your students to share their stories, if you share your stories, it's a way of making these empathetic connections between one another. So think about that. You know, I know that it, it re that's where, you know, it's, it falls upon your shoulders to think about making that connection with your discipline, but hey. Microsoft Office. Thank you. So. <laughs> And this is a quote from one of my students. Learning out loud helps us get to know each other. It makes us more sensitive to one another's opinions and thoughts, and we're more likely to be respectful to one another. And that's something that I've consistently seen over many, many years of using voice in my classes. Um, and one last practice I'd like to share is um, something called the wisdom wall, which I've been sharing for years, so it may not be new to you. Um, but the wisdom wall, first week of an online class, we know that anxiety is high. We know that students are looking at things going, oh, I can't do that. And I, you know, require my students to speak. That's not something usually, at least for my students have told me that they're expected to do in online classes. I kind of think it's important, but. Um, so at the, I've, I found that I could tell my students over and over as much as I wanted that, hey, I'll be here for you. You can do this, you know, and that's important to say. Those things are really important. But if they can hear from other students about what their experiences were in the class, it changes everything. So I started the Wisdom Wall, and I asked my students at the end of a class Be to leave not feedback. not discouraged, overwhelmed, or embarrassed. That is what I want to say because this class at first, that's how I felt. At first I was like, there's just too much homework. I don't know how I'm going to get it all with everything else that I have to do in my life. And then I felt embarrassed after learning that I have to talk on this stinking voice thread and I have to give my opinion. I mean, I'm, 
I don't want to, I have an opinion if I don't want to give it. No one's going to like what I have to say. Um, that's not the case. You know, look at it as an opportunity to express your opinion, uh, which we don't really often get the chance to do when we're taking classes. Usually it's, you know, we can um, contribute when we're in a class setting, but it's very limited. And this class in particular with the voice there gave us an opportunity to really speak our mind and say what we really wanted to say. So, um, you know, take heart. You know, if you keep up with the classes, keep up with your assignments, definitely won't be as overwhelming. Um, you know, just take each assignment as it comes and don't think about the next assignment. Think about what you're doing now. And just to add, voice start isn't stinky. Um, it's actually a really good tool and it was really fun actually working with it. I hope you could hear that. It's hard. The, the speakers are pointing that way, so it's hard for me to tell how clear it is on your end. But if you didn't hear that well, you can play it back because the slide on your resource page, those are all hot links, so they will play for you. Um, but this is a great thing to integrate into your class. If you use voice or not, um, it's definitely more powerful in voice, but I started doing this just in a Google Doc, and I just gave it to my students. I say, what, you know, what are you feeling, wh how are you feeling at the start of the class, and what do you know now that you wish you knew then? And then in the next class, you share that back with the, the students the first week. So the students who have all that anxiety have the opportunity to listen to what previous students have said. Um, and it's, it's a great way to really kind of tap in and, and also experience some of those magical moments that your students go through that you don't even know are there. So that brings us to the end. Um, we have a few minutes, we have eight minutes left. What we would like to do is give you an opportunity to share how you humanize your online class or share a story maybe from a class that, that relates to this topic. So why don't you just take a couple of minutes and get into groups of um, two to three and share? Yes, yes, all you good students out there. Just quick, just quickly. Doesn't have to be anything formal. All right, one more minute. Okay, why don't you go ahead and wrap up. Okay, we're bringing it back, we're bringing it back, we're bringing it back. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 
four, three, two, one. Shh. Hey, that was good. Nice. So we, we have about five minutes left, and we'd love to hear a couple of practices. So raise your hand if you have something you'd like to share. In the back. Okay, we, we're going to get, get a you microphone a mic. to you because we are webcasting this, and we want everybody to hear your, your fabulous idea. Well, one of the things we were talking about is, that, are you using VoiceThread? Is that what yes. I'm seeing up there? Which I love, and we actually pay for a license through our college. However, so do we. one of the issues keeps coming up is, Closed captioning. That's now, not if, a humanizing practice. Oh, it's a practice I know, no, I, I totally get it. So I understand that when a student I have an answer. Video to you, I have okay. an answer. Okay, listen. Go talk to Caption Sync because uh, VoiceThread has just integrated um, a partnership with Caption Sync for captioning. So VoiceThread is using captioning now. If the users are integrating that third-party partner into their license, they you can add captioning to your content in VoiceThread. So when you say user, do you mean the college itself, the administrator setting that up, or do you mean the student? It would be part of what you're paying for your license. OK. Yeah. So and is VoiceThread charging new. you more for that? I'm just out of curiosity. What was the question? Is VoiceThread charging you more for that? It's, it's not something you pay through Voice. It's like if you want your YouTube videos captioned, right? You don't pay YouTube. You pay for the captioning service. Oh, so it's a separate amount of money yeah, that you pay separate Yeah, it's Caption Beyond Sync, Clip. and they're a captioning uh, service provider. They're in, they actually have a booth here at the conference, and you can ask them about it. Okay. Who has a humanizing practice to share? And I can talk to you more about accessibility and voice art after if you'd like. I'd be happy to. Let's talk about we just did a faculty inquiry group, um, and one of our participants created a cheat sheet for closed captioning, and there's something online, I don't remember the name of it. I've gotten two hours of sleep last night, and I really don't remember the name of it, but it's free. And apparently all you do is you open it up, and you play the video, and it actually does it for you, and you just cut and paste. It's really amazing. Who has a humanizing practice to share I with do. us? <laughs> I've got one. So um, this, is, this is on, okay. So I teach a marketing class, and every one of my students has to come up with a business that they personally are representing. If they don't actually have a brick and mortar business, then they have to give advice. And in my class, every one of them uses a site called tinyletter.com. They have to sign up and create a newsletter, and then they have to subscribe to one another's newsletters. And one of their assignments is they have to give something away for free to the rest of the class. And all of the class, they, it's a timed thing, but at a certain point of the class, they all receive emails from one another because they've subscribed to one another. They get free advice, they get a free offer. I had one student um, who owns a winery, uh, she, she did a raffle type situation with the class and she sent somebody who was over 21 um, some wine. <laughs> I think the other option was chocolate. Um, but they all get to know one another, and I really like the advice that they hand out to one another, um, or favorite recipes if they have, if they represent a cooking site or something like that. But they they have you know 25 emails that they receive on a certain day, each one of them talking about something personal that the student is giving to the rest of their classmates. Love that. A lot of the six C's are in there. That's great. And okay. another, another one? I'm right sorry, here. Sorry. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, some of you might be coming to my presentation tomorrow, and I'll say this um, maybe again, but I um, like uh, Bradshaw and the family and Brene Brown and some of these other uh, type of psychologists. It uh, really seems to connect students together. And one of the other added uh, features that I use along with those two um, is the Kersey.com, the Myers-Briggs temperament, um, personality temperament assessment. And students really get a kick out of learning about their assessments or the five love languages by Gary Towns Townsend or Small, I can't remember right now. Um, and again, that deals with an assessment and again about their personality and they really just start to interact um, very well right at the beginning, uh, the onset of the class. Uh, my textbook also has an assessment, their learning style assessment, and they get a kick out of, that's exactly how I am and this is really cool to learn about myself. And so the d discussion boards is what really um, uh, gets them going on the personal level with that. And then again, because I have the Bradshaw and the Brene Brown, uh, some of the 
things that I'm doing with a narrative and incorporating things, um, it just, the class gets intimate pretty quickly. Awesome. Thank you. And we are at, right at 3 o'clock, I believe. So um, thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for sharing. And Thank you for being here. Life.